welcome back to the Unseen Podcast, a podcast dedicated to missing people, unresolved cases and UK true crime. Today we're going to be exploring the case of Ivy Davis, who was murdered in Westcliff on sea in Essex in 1975. Her murder was violent and happened in her own home, causing the local community to be outraged. Her case remains unsolved, however in recent years there has been some progress made. This episode contains descriptions that some listeners may find distressing, so listener discretion is advised. The seaside resort of Westcliff-on-Sea is a suburb of Southend-on-Sea, which is located in Essex, in the southeast of England. It's known for its seaside location and the famous Cliffs Pavilion Theatre that was built during the 1930s. Due to its proximity to London, only 35 miles away, it's a good commuter area and a place that people would come to escape the city. Westcliff-on-Sea is where Ivy Davis lived and owned her business during the 1970s. She owned the Orange Tree Cafe, located on Westcliff Seafront, and by 1975 she had run it successfully for around eight years. It's reported in the Daily Mirror at the time that Ivy was known by people that knew her as Auntie Ivy, and her business was doing well. Ivy herself lived not far from the seafront on Holland Road in Westcliff. At this time, Ivy was 48 years old and was a mother of seven. This information, however, was not known to everyone that became acquainted with Ivy. Her son, Vic, later told the South End Standard that Ivy had not had an easy life and that all seven of her children were placed in a children's home when he was just three years old. Ivy had been the victim of domestic abuse at the hands of his father, and when Ivy had a new partner, he didn't want to take on seven children. This led to her decision of giving them up. This must have been an awful decision to make for Ivy, and Vickers later stated that he understands the decision that she made, as he once again reconnected with her in his teenage years. During this time, he would meet his mum every Thursday at 7pm, and the pair would take a walk down the seafront, I'll go out and have some food together. Ivy was dedicated to her business and it was a popular cafe in the local area. She was a well-known member of the community and she appeared to be enjoying her life as a business owner. Ivy was well-liked and popular and it's reported in the Echo News that one person described her saying she was one of the most generous, warm-hearted and helpful people you could ever meet. It was due to her dedication to her business that on the 4th of February 1975, employees at her cafe realised that she had not turned up for work. This was highly unusual for her and it rang some alarm bells. Due to the concern that those that knew Ivy had about her absence, a neighbour named Sheila Zamet decided to gain entry to her home to see if she was okay. It's reported in the Echo News that neighbours in the area in Holland Road heard Sheila's screams from Ivy's house. They were described as piercing, and immediately it was clear that something was wrong. Sheila had found Ivy. Her body was in the living room of the house, and it was evident that she had been attacked. She was wearing just her nightdress, and she had injuries to her head, including a cut on her forehead that Sheila described as looking like a knife wound. Her injuries were extensive, and the scene was horrific. The police were immediately called out to the scene and they set about examining any evidence that they could find. The police recovered what was eventually thought to be the murder weapon. It was a steel metal pry bar tool that appeared to have been left at the scene. The police took this into evidence in the hope that it may lead them to the perpetrator. Upon examination of Ivy's body, investigators also discovered a ligature around Ivy's neck. While this ligature had left a mark on her neck, it was later established that this was not the cause of death, and that that had been due to the blunt force trauma. When police searched the house in an effort to find any more evidence, they found that many of the rooms had been ransacked. There were items everywhere, and it seemed that whoever had committed the murder had been frantically searching for something. The crime was very violent, however during the initial investigation, police were struggling to come up with a motive for the murder. Ivy was well liked, and it did not appear that she would have been the target of such a horrendous attack. 
The severity of the wound suggested that this was a very angry attack. However, the question was, why? The searching of the house implied that perhaps the killer had known what they were looking for. And just the day after her murder, police made a statement in the Daily Mirror newspaper, explaining their theory of the crime. Chief Inspector Peter Croxford, head of South End West CID, said, We think the killer struck for the money. The hypothesis was formed that the killer had entered Ivy's house, perhaps knowing that she owned the cafe, and she may have had takings at her home. The article also adds more detail about what the police believed may have happened. It's reported that they believe that Ivy may have been followed home from the cafe, and this is how the killer had then entered and attacked her. It's also reported that she may have been attacked for just £20, which would be around £170 today. This puts Ivy's murder in perspective, because if this was the case, she had lost her life for, in the grand scheme of things, a very small amount of money. Police also added that there was jewellery found on top of the TV in the living room, suggesting that the killer may have left in a hurry and did not necessarily take everything they had wanted to from the house. Police set up an incident room at Holland Road and set about going door to door to interview neighbours. It was hoped that perhaps they had seen or heard something the night before her body was eventually recovered. Officers also did an extensive search of the area surrounding Ivy's home, using metal detectors, spades and pickaxes in an effort to find further evidence. Police tracker dogs were also brought in and piles of rubbish were sifted through. An appeal was also made to anyone that may have been in the area at the time and may have noticed something or someone suspicious that may aid in the investigation. Due to the violence involved in Ivy's murder, headlines describe that the police may indeed be looking for a mad axeman that was on the loose. The community were terrified and devastated by Ivy's death. Many people in the area knew her and many came out to describe what she was like. It's reported in Echo News that a regular at the Orange Tree Cafe stated she was one of the nicest people that you could meet and the news has really shattered us. Another cafe owner on the seafront named Phyllis Kelly told the Daily Mirror Mrs Davis was a quiet person. I think she lived on her own. She was liked by everybody. Nobody could quite get their heads around what had happened and the fact that this person was still out on the loose was even more alarming. Ivy's son Vic later told the press how the news about his mother's death finally reached him. He was just 18 at the time and explained that he had become involved with some petty thefts in the area which had landed him in Northampton Prison at the time of his mother's death in February 1975. He explained how he found out to Echo News, stating That week was my turn to be in charge of the TV and I was just about to change the channel but then it said, murder in South End. I said, hold on a minute, lads, I want to see if I know who it is. The next thing I know, a picture of a woman is on the TV. Someone said, do you know who it is then? I just froze. We were looking at a picture of my own mother. This was absolutely devastating to Vic, who it's reported had to then spend two weeks recovering in the hospital wing due to the shock of what he'd heard. It's reported in the same article that prison officers had not told him about what had happened to his mother as they thought they didn't get along and weren't close. This was a horrendous way of finding out about his mother's murder and something that stays with him to this day. Police continued to try and make progress in the case and one of the lines of inquiry was the metal pry bar that had been found at the scene. They were able to establish that the tool had been bought from the Snap-on Tools Company and only 2,000 had been sold to customers in the UK at the time of Ivy's death. This was an interesting piece of information and suggested that whoever had bought it may well have had a reason to have this tool with them, perhaps due to their work. It was of course always possible that the perpetrator had got it from elsewhere, or even stolen it, so as much as this information did partially narrow down the suspect pool, it was not a slam dunk it did not directly lead them to a suspect. It was reported at the time that the police were somewhat baffled by the murder and were unsure of the exact motive or profile of the person that they were looking for. 
it was clear that the investigation was very frustrating for those involved with it. Despite this, it was reported at the time that two men were arrested not long after the murder. This was a step in the right direction, however it was later reported that they had been released without charge. This was a blow to the investigation and meant that once again it was back at square one. In 1975, police inquiries were of course limited by the amount of evidence that was found. Forensic evidence could not be tested and the knowledge of the importance of certain evidence was not known. This of course hindered the progress that could be made at the time, as in many cold cases, and it meant that police were much more reliant on witness statements. It appeared that in Ivy's case this was also limited, and therefore progress began to slow down. Over the next several months and years, Ivy's case remained cold, without any further updates or progress. Those that knew her continued to remain hopeful that something new would be discovered and her killer would finally be found. It's reported in the Echo News that Vic visited a medium in 1996 in the hope that this would help him find out what happened to his mother. The medium told him that Ivy could describe the killer. The medium passed this information on to police, however it was reported that the lead was never followed up on in relation to the investigation. It seemed that after almost 25 years, Ivy's murder would remain unsolved, with no real leads. This changed in 2004, when Ivy's case was once again reported on. Police told the public that they had received an anonymous call relating to the case. The call had come in to Crime Stoppers on Thursday the 12th of August, around 12.30pm. Police stated that the caller appeared to have information pertinent to the case. A spokesperson told the BBC, The brief details they left made us believe this person knew more about Ivy's murder than there is in the public domain. They appealed for the person to come forward and contact Crime Stoppers again, as they believed that their information was important. There was no follow-up, it would appear, to this phone call. However, it did kick-start further investigation into Ivy's case. The following year, a cold case inquiry was reopened into the murder and detectives were once again following up leads and actively working on the case. This fresh approach to the investigation quickly began to uncover new evidence. It was reported that detectives discovered that at the time of the murder, further evidence had actually been found during the search of the home. A semen stain had been located on the living room carpet indicating that Ivy had been sexually assaulted. When police attempted to locate the carpet, it was discovered that it had actually been given to some of Ivy's neighbours not long after the murder. The neighbours had held on to it and it had remained in their loft since 1975. Luckily for police, they were able to recover the carpet and sent it off for testing in the hope that there may be some viable evidence still contained in it. There was biological evidence retrieved off the carpet, and DNA was extracted, however detectives came across another brick wall. The DNA, when ran through various databases, came up with no match. It appeared that whoever had left the evidence behind had not committed any other crimes that were currently in the database. Once again, the case proved frustrating, and the lack of evidence certainly proved difficult to overcome. In 2006, it was reported that an arrest had been made. A 68-year-old man from Basildon had been arrested for Ivy's murder. There is very limited information surrounding this arrest and the evidence for it has not been published. This is probably because not long after his arrest, the man was released without charge. Like in 1975, the evidence against this suspect did not appear to be enough to charge him for anything. The cold case inquiry, like the investigation before it, did not find the killer, and Ivy's case once again lay unsolved. Years went by until 2017, when new information led to cold case detectives once again taking a look at Ivy's murder. Information came to light about a statement that was made in 1975 by one of Ivy's employees at the cafe. The woman reportedly told police that a man who appeared to be a doctor had visited the Orange Tree Cafe with a group of patients a few weeks before Ivy's murder. 
it was believed that Ivy had been engaged in conversation with the doctor and that she had agreed to meet him later on in South End. It would later turn out, however, that the man was not a doctor. He was actually a patient at the Runwell Mental Hospital nearby. He had recently absconded from the facility, along with the other patients who were there with him that day. Alarmingly, the man was also believed to have visited Ivy's home, and it was then that she realised he was indeed one of the patients and not a doctor. Vic, Ivy's son, later told Echo News about the incident, saying, I do remember this happening. We all made fun of her for being so gullible. He also told the paper about the statement made by the employee at the time. This woman was only a girl then, and working in my mother's cafe. She says she made a statement in 1975, but the cold case detectives have no record of it. The fact that this information was in some way lost to history was indeed worrying, as it would have been an important line of inquiry. In 2017, Essex Police stated that this was something that they were going to look into, and that it would be investigated thoroughly. They made a statement saying, Essex Police is aware of new information in relation to the murder of Ivy Davis in Westcliff in 1975, and investigations are ongoing. Officers continue to support Mrs Davis's family. This information was of course of interest to the police, who began looking into it as a possible new lead. This would not be the only theory, however, to emerge in the case. In 2019, another name was also reported on, one that had been thought about back in 1975. Patrick McKay. McKay is a convicted serial killer who has been dubbed in the press as the devil's disciple or the psychopath. He was convicted of the murders of three people in 1975. However, this was reduced to manslaughter due to diminished responsibility. McKay had grown up in Dartford in Kent along with his father Harold and his mother Marion. It's reported that there were issues noted early on with Patrick. He was known to have been a victim of domestic abuse as a child at the hands of his father and when Harold died when McKay was 10 it's alleged that Patrick began to then physically abuse his mother and siblings. During his teenage years he got into lots of problems with the law and had to be sectioned at one point. It's reported in the Metro newspaper that by the time he was arrested in 1975, he had been incarcerated, sectioned or detained at least 19 times, and he was only 22. It's reported in Kent Online that by the age of 15, he had been diagnosed as a psychopath and had become obsessed with Nazi ideology. In February 1975, 87-year-old widow Isabella Griffiths was found dead in her home in Chelsea in London after she had been beaten with a blunt object and stabbed. Her cause of death, however, was strangulation. There were signs of forced entry and it appeared upon her discovery that she had been there for around 12 days. The killer seemed to have stayed in the flat for a while after the murder with evidence showing that they had listened to the radio. Less than a month later, police were called to an address in Knightsbridge where they discovered the body of 89-year-old Adele Price. She too had been strangled and left in the kitchen. Just under two weeks later, in the village of Sean, near Gravesend in Kent, police made another terrible discovery. The body of Father Anthony Crean was discovered by a nun at his cottage. He was in the bath, which was filled with water, and it was clear that he had injuries to his head. It was later established that he had been struck in the head with an axe and then placed in the bath before the taps had been turned on. Just two days after discovering Father Crean, police tracked down Patrick McKay. It would turn out that McKay and Crean had been friends for around 18 months before his murder and that McKay had stolen an £80 cheque from Crean's house. Crean was known to be a selfless man who helped those in need However, this caused a rift in their relationship. McKay left to go to London, but later returned and it was discovered committed the murder. It wasn't long before McKay was also implicated in the murders of Isabella Griffiths and Adele Price. After his arrest, he began confessing to other murders, eight in total, that occurred between 1973 and 1975, one of which included Ivy Davis's murder 
which occurred in February, not long before the murder of Isabella Griffiths. If convicted of all of these charges, he could have been convicted on 11 counts of murder. Not long after these confessions, however, McKay retracted them, and the police had no choice but to charge him with five of these that they thought they had evidence on. He was eventually convicted on three manslaughter charges due to diminished responsibility and given a life sentence with a 20-year minimum term. The fact that McKay confessed to these other crimes has made some wonder if he could indeed have committed them. Ivy's son Victor is one of the people campaigning to find out if McKay could indeed be behind his mother's murder. This renewed campaign has come about due to the fact that McKay could indeed be released from prison in the not-so-distant future. Despite the severity of his crimes, the decision about his parole has been reviewed on ten different occasions since 1995. It's reported in the Metro newspaper that McKay has allegedly changed his name and been moved to an open prison as a next step to possibly being released. Vic told ITV that he was appalled at the idea that McKay could possibly be released, saying, There are various other families that have been grieving for the last 44 years over various unsolved crimes in their family. Yes, he's served his time for the crimes he's been convicted of and under the grounds of diminished responsibility. There's too many other crimes unsolved that are linked to him that he hasn't come clean about, so how can he be a reformed character if that's the case? Dartford MP Gareth Johnson is in agreement with Victor Davis, stating that he does not believe that McKay should be released either, and is also campaigning for this, saying that McKay remains a dangerous man. He told Kent Online, Although McKay rescinded his confessions to these other crimes, I feel they should now be fully investigated, and I'll be urging the Justice Secretary to do that. Clearly, if he was responsible for these other killings, McKay would have been given a longer sentence and may never have been deemed eligible for parole. McKay is currently the longest-serving inmate in the UK, having been incarcerated for 44 years. In June 2020, it was announced that McKay's parole hearing has been postponed, as Essex police were reopening investigations into other murders that have been linked to him. There has been no further information published by Essex Police about what this reinvestigation consists of or which murders were being looked into. The fact that unsolved murders are being reinvestigated is always a source of hope for their families and friends, and this could be the crucial inquiry needed to get them solved. Victor Davis has been an excellent advocate for his mother over the years and has continued to campaign and push for further investigation into the case. Ivy's murder was so savage and horrific, and it's clear that whoever committed it was not adverse to violence. The link to McKay is indeed an intriguing one, as it does appear to fit his MO, particularly in relation to Isabella Griffiths and Adele Price, and he did confess to the crime. This of course needs further investigation, and I'm unaware if there is any other evidence aside from these things. Could some of the other tips be important, such as the anonymous caller? or the information about the escaped patient who turned up at her house. I think that there is hope in Ivy's case, as there is evidence to look into, and of course DNA is always a possibility as it continues to improve. As Victor told Echo News, any information keeps the cold case team looking at my mother's murder. I think this epitomises what's important in old cases, coverage. The more we talk about them, the larger the chance is that they will be solved, and I really hope this happens for Ivy. If you know anything about Ivy Davis's murder in 1975, please contact Essex Police on 101 or Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. Thank you for listening to today's episode. I also want to thank Best Fiends for sponsoring this episode. If you're interested in downloading the game, the link is in the show notes and it's available free at the Apple App Store and Google Play. I want to also thank all of our patrons for your amazing support of the podcast. If you'd like to have a look at what we offer on there, including bonus episodes, ad-free early access and stickers, take a look at the link in the show notes. Thank you to everyone who continues to give us a review wherever you listen, it's always really helpful. Please do connect with me on social media on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram and YouTube 
or you can send me case suggestions or just general comments and questions to my email at theunseenpod at gmail.com. Just a reminder that this is the last episode before the break until the 25th of October. There will be a shorter bonus episode out at the end of September just to keep you going. Thanks for all your support for the break and I'll be back fortnightly after that with lots of new episodes after the baby is born. See you again soon and as always, I'm Caprice and this has been Unseen. Unseen.